Well, happy Father's Day to all the dads here and grandpas, great-grandpas. I don't know if we have that, but uh, welcome here, everyone, and we hope that this will be a special day for you, celebrating. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for each person that's here this morning, each person that's tuned in. And Lord, we pray for your special blessing on, on each, each one. And Lord, this morning as we also think of the dads, we pray that you would uh, give the, the fathers in our midst and, and the fathers all around us, Lord, that you would give your children who are fathers the strength they need to, to be the dads that they should, to to be the models, the, the husbands. And uh, Father, we pray that you would make them a blessing. We pray too, Lord, as we look at your word this morning, that you would speak to our hearts and uh, comfort, encourage, challenge, strengthen us, and just guide us as we look at your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The New York Times reported uh, a couple of years ago that fasting has become fashionable. And uh, according to the Times, people are paying as much as $3,500 a week to visit health spas to not eat anything. Except that they do get special treatment. And, uh, and, and I remember reading about one, uh, one spa in Desert Hot Springs, California where celebrities like Ben Affleck and uh, Courtney Love and people like that come. And uh, there, instead of stuffing themselves with steak and lobster, they, they live on apple cherry cocktails and herbal teas and laxatives and bee pollen and blended soups and water mixed with squeezed lemons. Well, I don't think that's fasting, though. And... Uh, Sometimes people nowadays also talk about medical fasts. And, uh, but that's not fasting either. We want to look this morning at, at fasting, this whole theme, and it's in, in Matthew 6. And uh, just before we look at that passage itself, just to remind you how this, this is uh, set up, how, how, how Jesus uh, approached this, he started off in, in Matthew 6, verse 1, by saying, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. And so this whole section is about how we do acts of righteousness. And Jesus talks about acts of righteousness as it relates to other people, Acts of righteousness as it relates to God. And then now acts of righteousness as it relates to ourselves. To our own spiritual disciplines. And so it started off then. And each section is exactly the same. It starts off in verse 2 for example. It says, so when you give to the needy. Do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets. To be honored by others. And then when verse 5. And when you pray. Do not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues. And on the street corners. To be seen by others. And then of course you have in between there. The Lord's prayer. And he teaches them how to pray. But if you were to take that out. Then it would just continue. Exactly in the same line. When he says in verse 16. When you fast. Do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. And so Jesus is, is, is saying here that, that, uh, that we are not to copy the, the Pharisees the way that they do things. 
and, uh, and, and he's assuming, though, that we will do these things that he's saying. And so, so here we have Jesus telling us how to practice our righteousness. So when it comes to God, we are to spend time in prayer. When it comes to other people, we are to be generous in giving. And now when it comes to fasting, he says we are to fast as well. And uh, because some people have said, well, maybe Christians don't have to fast. I mean, is this really for Christians? Because wasn't it just an Old Testament thing? And, and, and it was an Old Testament thing as well. In fact, there's only, though, one situation where God commands all of Israel to fast. And that is when it, when it comes to Yom Kippur, the annual day of atonement. And then you read in Leviticus 23, the Lord said to Moses, the tenth day of this seventh month is the day of atonement. Hold a sacred assemble and deny yourselves, which is the, another way of saying fast. And present a food offering to the Lord. Do not do any work on that day because it is the day of atonement when atonement is made for you before the Lord your God. Those who do not deny themselves on that day must be cut off from their people. So that is the one time when God commanded that Israel had to fast for one day. And so that's the only day that, that, that God commanded that. But some, some Christians say, well, yeah, but look at Luke 5. In Luke 5, there, there, it's, it's a story where Jesus is at the house of these Pharisees, and they're asking him some questions. And in Luke 5, verse 33, it says, One day some people said to Jesus, John the Baptist's disciples fast and pray regularly, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees. Why are your disciples always eating and drinking? Jesus responded, Do wedding guests fast while celebrating with the groom? Of course not. But someday the groom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. Now, some people have taken this in a very narrow sense that the, that the groom will be taken away, and that was when Jesus was betrayed and arrested and crucified. And so they say, yeah, at that time, Jesus was taken away. But then he came back at the resurrection. And so some say, well, during that time they fasted, but it doesn't apply otherwise. But it doesn't make sense because actually during that time they weren't fasting. Because it, it says there that Jesus appeared to them and he asked them for food and they had prepared food. So it wasn't that. What makes more sense is to take it that, that this is referring to when Jesus ascends to heaven. And when Jesus ascends to heaven, then Jesus says, someday the groom will be taken away from them, he will ascend to heaven, and then they will fast. And that is indeed what happened in the New Testament. You have a number of situations where, where we are told that the early church fasted. And we'll look at some of those situations. But what we learn here then is that Jesus, in this situation, he is not commanding that people should fast, but he is assuming that all believers, all disciples will at some time fast. And so, and so he is saying to them that you will fast, but he says, don't make it obvious like the Pharisees do. When they fast. For they try to look miserable and disheveled. So people will admire them for their fasting. I tell you the truth. That is the only reward they will ever get. Maybe just before we look at the passage a little bit more detail. We should also look at what is a fast. And uh, in, in the Hebrew there, there are two words that are, that are given for the word fast. 
And the one word means to cover over. It means to cover the mouth. In other words, don't let anything get in. That's the meaning there. But the second word is very interesting. That's also used for fasting. And that is, that is a word that means to afflict oneself or to humble oneself. And in fact, a lot of places, this word ana, which means humble oneself, is used. And then in the New Testament, there's only one word for fasting, and that word just simply means to not eat. So fasting is when for spiritual purposes we withhold from eating food. And that can be for a short while, it can be for a long while. And fasting also means that we not just fast physically. Because that's what the Pharisees were doing. They were physically fasting, but they weren't fasting. Because fasting has to do with the whole attitude of our hearts. It has to do with our soul. If we're not fasting with our hearts, then we're not fasting. Then we're just doing an outward show. For the Pharisees, they were proud of themselves that they fasted. In fact, in Luke 18, you have this Pharisee praying. And, and the Pharisee says... Lord, I'm just so good. I fast twice a week and I give tithes. And he's basically saying, am not I amazing? He was proud of himself. And the Pharisees, in fact, did fast two days a week, Mondays and Thursdays. And it's interesting that Christians kind of fell into the same trap later. After a little while, then the Christians said, okay, now we need to fast two days a week. But then they said, we won't take the same days as the Pharisees. So they said, let's take Wednesdays and Fridays. Because Wednesday was the day that Judas betrayed Jesus. And Friday is the day that Jesus was crucified. And so then there was, uh, there was an instruction manual in, in, the, in the early, er, early church. And they... And they said, now everyone is supposed to fast on these two days. In fact, it became an obligation that they had to do. So there was different kinds of fasts that you find in Scripture. There was normal fasts. And a normal fast could be a day, it could be, it could be three days, it could be a week, or it could be up to 40 days. Jesus himself fasted for 40 days. That was a normal fast. Because a normal fast was just not eating anything. And just surviving on water. That was a normal fast. But then there was also what, 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 was, what is called an extreme fast. And that is when believers would abstain from both food and water. And Moses, for example, it, it, it's amazing. It, I mean, it's really a miracle because Moses, it says in Deuteronomy 9, verse 9, this happened when I was on the mountain receiving the tablets of stone inscribed with the words of the covenant that the Lord had made with you. I was there for 40 days and 40 nights, and all that time I ate no food and drank no water. And then after that, he comes down the mountain, sees the people dancing and worshiping the calf. He breaks the, the tablets of stone, and then he goes right back up the mountain. And then we read, then as before, I threw myself down before the Lord for 40 days and nights. I ate no bread and drank no water because of the great sin you had committed by doing what the Lord hated, provoking him to anger. Moses did an 80-day fast without water or food. And that is, that is a miracle. Nobody can normally do that. In fact, Queen Esther, when she calls for an extreme fast, 
which she does, just before she goes into the presence of the king because the king may not receive her and she'd be killed. And so she, she calls for all the Jews. She says, go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will do the same. But there it was for three days. And so extreme fasts are not recommended for any longer period of time. Water is something that people really do need. Food, not so much for a while. And then there's also what, what the Bible describes, uh, which we would call a, a partial fast. Daniel, for example. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. I ate no delicacies, no meat or wine entered my mouth. Nor did I anoint myself at all for the full three weeks. So there's what you would call a partial fast where you would, where you would abstain from certain foods for a certain length of time. Okay, so those are the different kinds of fasting. That's what fast means. But fasting always means that it is something that you do because you want to come to God. And you come to God, well, not just physically, but you come to God with your heart and soul. That is fasting. So there's a right way and a wrong way to fast. And Jesus begins with the wrong way. Jesus says, don't fast like the Pharisees. Because the Pharisees, what they would do is they would, they would make sure that Monday morning or Thursday morning, that they would, first of all, not do their hair. They would not wash their faces. In fact, some of them would even put ashes on their faces. And then they would go out there and into the public and be in, in the public as much as they could. And they would just look gloomy and sad and would look so tired, even though it was just for a day that they were fasting. And people would say, wow. Those Pharisees, they sure are dedicated people, aren't they? And really what it was, they, they, they made themselves look ghastly and awful, but inside their hearts, they were bursting with pride. They were absolutely proud of what great fasters they were. In fact, this word that, that, that translates uh, in English, says in order to be seen by men, is, 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 the, is the same word that we get our word theater from. In other words, they are in a theater giving a performance. Their religion was a public spectacle. And as, as Christians... I mean, we are also aware that we are being watched, but the audience is not people. The audience is God. There are some other wrong motives, though. Jesus doesn't cover some of them here. But uh, there are some other wrong motives as well, though. And one of the wrong motives that is probably the most common one that we do nowadays is the motive of we fast so that we can get. We fast so that God is going to come across. Scott McKnight says, the most influential understanding of fasting today is the instrumental theory. In the simplest of terms, this theory teaches that we fast in order to gain some benefit. But instrumental fasting is all but impossible to find in the pages of the Bible and is rarely reflected in ancient Judaism or the rabbis. But sometimes now you actually have books that even would suggest that you should fast if you want to get something. 
I remember uh, a, a book that, uh, that uh, Jerry, uh, J Jerry Falwell wrote with uh, Elmer Towns, I think it was, and they, and they wrote this book, and the, and the chapter headings were things like, uh, like uh, we got so and so many acres for our church, or we got $50 million, or I got a spouse. And the whole teaching that seemed to be behind it was, was if you just fast, then it's like a spiritual hunger strike. You go on a hunger strike and then God, you, you just twist his arm and God just says, okay, 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 yes, yes, 10 days is enough. I'll give it to you. Jerry Falwell, for example, his university was in debt by $70 million. And so he fasted, first of all, for 40 days with just juice and then in 25 days later, he fasted again for 40 days with just juice. And he got $50 million for the university. And so they made the connection and they said it's because of the fasting that God answered and gave the benefit. Well, that is not the reason we are to fast. If you look in the, in, the, in, in the Old Testament, you will find that sometimes when they needed guidance, they fasted. And, uh, and, there's, and there's nothing wrong with a church fasting when they're looking for a pastor or something. That's perfectly fine. But if my, if my goal in coming to God in fasting is to get something, if that is my primary goal, then I'm not fasting right. That's not the right motive. What is the right way to fast? Jesus says, but when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to men that you are fasting, but only to your Father." Who is unseen. And your father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And there's three things I just like to point out from this from this verse. The one is that fasting is in secret. And uh, Jesus is saying we're not supposed to broadcast it to everyone. Although you should probably tell your wife if you're fasting, so that she won't make your favorite dish. And, uh, and maybe it's better to, to tell some people sometimes, or if someone invites you over for lunch, it's probably a good idea to say it won't work this time. And if you need to say something, then, then you can say it. If, if you can say why it won't work, because you're fasting. But, but the, the, the thought here is what Jesus is saying is, it's not that nobody else can know. But what he's saying is, you don't do it because you want other people to know. You don't do it for that reason. And that's why when we fast, we also shouldn't walk around with this look of, of tiredness and hunger in our faces. And, oh man, am I hungry. Because then we are, we are taking away from what the purpose of fasting is. The second thing that you notice here is that Jesus says that you're fasting before your father. And I think that is the biggest thing. When we fast, we are fasting because we're coming into the presence of God. That's why in the, in, in, in the Old Testament, People would, would humble themselves. It, it, it talks about humbling yourself or, or afflicting yourself. Because the focus was always squarely on God and totally on God. When we fast, we're focusing on God because, because we want to hear God. We want to get closer to God. We want to have interaction with Him. 
John Piper said this of fasting. He said, Jesus is calling for a radical orientation on God himself. He is pushing us to have a real, utterly authentic, personal relationship with God. And Andrew Murray said that prayer is the one hand with which we grasp the invisible. Fasting the other with which we let loose and cast away the visible. Prayer needs fasting for its full and perfect development. And whether there are physical benefits when we fast or not, our fasting is coming before God. And we are coming into his presence. And there are a number of reasons why Christians, for example, would, would fast. One of the reasons is that sometimes we just need to come before the presence of God to just humble ourselves. And sometimes, especially when we have sinned and we repent of that sin, it is totally appropriate to come before God in fasting and to do what he, he calls afflicting oneself or humbling oneself. To humble ourselves before him and acknowledge who we are and what we've done. You have, for example, in Joel, God tells the elders to declare a holy fast. Call a sacred assembly. Summon the elders and all who live in the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. Fasting can be a crying out to the Lord because we realize our sinfulness. We humble ourselves before him. Fasting is also appropriate when we have a crisis in our lives. I think of King... King Jehoshaphat, when the Ammonites and Moabites were coming. And, uh, and, and he calls a fast. And the people fast and pray. And, and incidentally, fasting is almost always together with prayer. Fasting and prayer always goes together. Although fasting and humbling oneself often also goes together. But at times like that, this king and his people prayed and fasted, and God gave them a victory. I think of David, when, when David had sinned and his son was dying, and there was a crisis. David fasted and prayed. And then once the son died, then he got up and ate. But it was because of the crisis he was fasting. And I think there's one other time when, when we as Christians, when God may call us as Christians to fast. And one is when sometimes in our prayer lives, sometimes in our walk with God, things get really dry. And I'm, I'm sure you've had that. I know I've had that. Where there are times where, where, where the Christian life is just so blah, and so daily, and so there's just nothing exciting that, 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 that makes you excited about it or enthused. And sometimes at times like that, when, when our spiritual life is low, and when, you're, when you're, your strength in your ministry is low, those are times when God may call us to fasting. Charles Finney, said, sometimes I would find myself in a great measure empty of this power. I would then set apart a day for private fasting and prayer, fearing that this power had departed from me. After humbling myself and crying out for help, the power would return upon me with all its freshness. And I think that is one of the most beautiful results of fasting. Charles Spurgeon said, Our seasons of fasting and prayer at the tabernacle have been high days indeed. 
Never has heaven's gate stood wider. Never have our hearts been nearer the central glory of just being in the presence of God. And if you find that your spiritual life is kind of dull and, and, and is just dry, and there's no vitality there, then we need to be open to God prompting us at those times and saying, why don't you fast? Why don't you fast for a couple of days? Because what fasting does is it focuses our hearts and our minds on God. And it, it clears our thinking. It, 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 it's like one person said, even physically, the blood can go to the head instead of going to the, to the system that, that, that processes all the food. And we need to be open to God directing us in this way. The third thing that you notice here, what Jesus says is, and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. You will be rewarded if you fast. If we fast with our physically and we fast with our heart and our soul, for whatever purpose, God is going to reward us. Sometimes that reward will, will take shape in, in just having a greater intensity and emphasis in prayer and just having more, more power in prayer in our lives. Sometimes fasting will feed your faith. And sometimes when we fast in a situation where we're in a crisis, we need guidance God will cause our faith to grow and be strengthened. And sometimes fasting will just light a fire in our souls and give us a new enthusiasm and joy and zest for following Christ. These are all rewards that God can give us. But if the only reward that God would give us would be this next one that would be enough. And this reward would be that you will have a deeper, stronger, more intimate, close, loving relationship with God. That he would be more central in your life. That would be worth it all if that's the only reward that we got to draw closer to God. Bill Bright called fasting the spiritual atomic bomb that will demolish evil, spark national revival, and speed fulfillment of the Great Commission. It'll, do, it'll have many benefits in our lives. But I think the biggest benefit is if we ourselves are drawn closer to God. And it's interesting, he talks here about our Heavenly Father again. It's not just a distant God that we're trying to get close to, but it's a, it's a Heavenly Father. And our Heavenly Father wants to draw close to us. So the question becomes, are we willing to fast? God is not commanding it. Jesus is not commanding that we have to. But Jesus is assuming that we will. He's assuming that if, if we are disciples, that we will fast at some point. And whether for health reasons, you can only do it for a meal or two, or whatever. But, but, but we should be willing to fast as Jesus wants us to. And I would, I would suggest that, that if you're going to fast, that you start with a shorter fast. We don't run before we can crawl. And so it's best to start with a short time. And then spend that time in prayer. Praying and maybe taking some time to just re reflect on a verse or two in Scripture. 
I know there's there's some some retreats, especially in Austria, they would have spiritual retreats for and this was for evangelical people. And and uh, and at these retreats, they would they would basically be quiet most of the time except at the meal in the evening. But uh but they would have just a few Verses that they would share with people in the beginning of the day. And then they would fast during the day. And, uh, and then the evening come together. But uh, fasting can be something that is very meaningful. But we wouldn't do it because just because it's meaningful. We want to do it because we want to get closer to God. That is the big reason. I just, I just saw, thought of another reason why sometimes people can come and fast. And, and I remember one time uh, Jesus' disciples were trying to drive out this evil spirit. And, and Jesus says to them, this kind only comes out by prayer and fasting. And, and it made me think of, of when, when we sometimes have an addiction or a sinful habit or, or struggle with something or there's a demon of some kind in, in our lives because of sin that plagues us. That's also a time where we can come before God and fast and ask God to release us from that. So whatever the reason that you would choose to fast... God wants us to do it at some point. And, uh, and when you fast, whether you do a partial fast, whether you do a normal fast, or if you do an extreme fast, but God can bless any fast that we do and any promises if we fast, coming to him, that then he will reward us. And so may God direct us and, and guide us as to when we should perhaps at some point fast. Even if it's for a little bit, for a day, maybe some he will direct to fast for a longer time. But, but I know that it's, it's, it's very worthwhile. And, and the biggest benefit we can get is that we will come close to God and become more intimate with him. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much that you have given us this way of coming to you. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you yourself were an example and that you, you fasted for 40 days. And Lord, we thank you that you uh, that we have the privilege as well and that you call us to that. I pray that you just help each one of us as we listen to your voice, that we would hear you when you are encouraging us to do some fasting. And Lord, help us draw close to you. You have given your life for us. You have sacrificed everything for us. You died on that cross for us. And Lord, you've done everything for us. And I pray that we would be willing to give up a little bit to come to you. We pray, Lord, if there's anyone here that has never trusted in you as their Savior, that you would help them this morning to put their faith in you. And Lord, we just pray that you would continue to bless your word to our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.